thoughts about the change. Um, and I would like to speak about something that sounds a bit somber. So to begin, um, perhaps a question, whether you're familiar with a quote of Woody Allen about what his um, opinion on the brain is. Anybody? He said it's his second favorite organ. Of course, yes, it's a joke. If he um, were to think about it, he would very soon realize that without the full faculties of the brain, he would have very little use of the other one. So I propose that um, it is about the brain and that there is a reason why we don't need to talk about it tonight. Um, it's unique, it's irreplaceable, it's different from other organs in our body. Um, you can lose a spleen, you can donate a kidney, you can... So lose a spleen, donate a kidney, you can have a heart transplant. It'll still be you. But the brain, when its function changes, slightly even, things happen and we sometimes say he's not or she's not the same person. We know that, for example, when we're drunk or madly in love, these things happen. We are just not the same people. Things, however, get much worse and a lot more serious when the brain dysfunction, when there is something wrong with it in case of any of the many brain disorders. Now, I'd like to ask you, again, rhetorically, because I cannot see you, do you know anybody with a brain disorder? Anybody with a dysfunction of the brain? And I'm pretty sure you do. Maybe you can voice your opinion. Do you know somebody in chronic pain? Somebody with migraines? Sleep disorders? Eating disorders? Depression? A major thing. Um, schizophrenia? Epilepsy? Brain trauma? Parkinson's disease? Dementia? If you do, then you know how horrible life can be for people who are suffering from these disorders. And not just for them, but also for their families and people who might need to take care of them. Now, I have a personal experience with brain disorders. My grandmother um, had a stroke. Then a few years later, she had another one and she was gone. Like that. I had a grandfather. He was a professor, an intellectual, but he died horribly demented after years of slowly disintegrating before our eyes. And the toll on my family was huge. I clearly remember the agonizing hopelessness that my parents experienced. And I also, on the other hand, can remember my own childish bewilderment. It was my grandfather who told me, um, trust in science, trust the doctors. They know. Yet, when we were asking them what was really going on, why it was happening, what we can do to perhaps halt it, reverse, treat him, bring him back, there were no answers. So fast forward a few years, several decades, to be truthful, to today. I'm a brain researcher and a physician. Both my grandfather would be proud. Um, and I can tell you from a certain perspective that in the past decades, neuroscience has made great leaps. We have learned a lot about the amazing complexity of the brain structure and function. It's happening through new methods that are being used that are revealing the secrets of the human brain. And the results, you've seen one embedded in the first presentation where there were this um, 
a colorful image of myriad connections within the human brain, a very complex picture brought about by a new um, imaging technique that reveals these connections inside the human brain. Or animals, of course, we can study animals as well. And actually this behind me is an animal brain. It's just an illustration of the amazing complexity of structure that then begets a complex function. In this case, it's um, part of the hippocampus of a rodent. A hippocampus is a structure in the brain that deals with memory. It's colored in such a way that it reveals the number of cells and their connections, and we can all appreciate that it looks complex. It also functions in a very complex way. There's been successes, but I can tell you, dealing with the area of neuroscience that has something to do with what took away my grandfather, neurodegeneration, that we haven't made the progress we would need to make yet. Um, not for the lack of time. Um, even my own research with my colleagues, we've done, we've looked at things and done some that are worth mentioning. I will not bore you with details. Just to say, for example, that we've studied the mechanisms of neurodegeneration. What kills cells? Um, a little bit along the lines of those first um, points, or the points from the first presentation, um, about what it is that makes certain cells susceptible and causes them to die too early and bring about the disease. We've looked at mechanisms or possibilities to diagnose brain disorders early, neurodegeneration, when it starts to happen as early as possible, when there might still be some time to use treatment options, and should there be any. We were working on developing some of the treatment options. What I'm showing you behind is just an example of um, using one substance, an attractive one, um, a pigment from the curry spice that can actually be used to label the disease brain changes rather early on. It's labeled in green. And it has some potential also in inhibiting their development and the onset of diseases, at least in some model um, systems that we've looked at. We've taken one of the substances that we worked with a bit further. We took it from working with it in vitro at the bench to the point where it was ready and was actually tested in a clinical setting in patients, coupled with the method for um, displaying it with the positron emission tomography um, scanning system, we were able to reveal the presence of this substance in the brains of patients even before the onset of clinical signs of the disease. And then we were able, as the picture shows in the upper row, just look at the red in the three images, follow the progression of that disease and get the feeling for um, how the pathology in the brain correlated with the clinical signs. It was nice. It was a successful um, example of what we call translational neuroscience, taking the basic science research and bringing it to the clinical setting. Yet, at the same time, I'll be the first one to admit that it's not enough. Because when we are by the bedside and we are facing a patient with a brain disorder, for example, neurodegenerative disease, there is very little that we can offer in terms of answering the questions of what is the pathophysiology behind it? What's going on? Why is it going on? What can we do to prevent it? How can we diagnose it accurately and early enough? And what is there that we can do to treat? And we really need to tackle these issues because it's not just about the individual human suffering um, and the suffering of the families around the patients. It's about financial cost as well. This um, is the number that came out of a systematic European study that looked at the cost of brain disorders. Much like the ones that I asked you about in the beginning, they looked at 19 groups of brain disorders, looked at how frequently they occur in the population of 
Europe, and looked at the direct and indirect costs per person for these diseases. It's a huge, staggering number. Now, it is, but what does it mean? I don't know how to bring it closer. A colleague, a friend, suggested that I tell you how many iPads that can buy. I don't know, and I could be clear. But I can tell you that it is the exact number of the um, financial crisis uh, firewall of the Eurozone. It's a lot. And it also amounts to about twice the combined cost of cardiovascular diseases and cancer. I'm not competing here. It's partly because of the successes in the cardiovascular disease and cancer that we are able to see part of this cost. Um, this is the trend occurring globally. Matej has already mentioned it initially when, when he invited me on stage, that due to low mortality and low fertility, what we see, and this is an example for Europe, um, the trend for the population to age is quite dramatic. By 2050, not just in Europe, but in much of the world, beyond 20% of the population will be older than 65 years. These trends, combined with the high health care cost for brain disorders that are also more frequent as we age, is going to be unmanageable, unsustainable. So we really need to do something. We need to, um, and I don't have a plan here, it's time for change. We need to come together, the researchers, the healthcare providers, we need to mobilize the policymakers, we need to get the industry intensely involved, the pharmaceutical industry has been fleeing this area of research. It's not very lucrative, it's not very easy to succeed. We need to get them back to the table to discuss these issues. We need to find a way to reconsider the current strategies and to find better ones to deal with these issues as soon as possible. It's actually quite imperative that we hurry because these problems, um, as we saw, are imminent and change is going to take time. But it's not just about what the governments can do. Um, I would like to ask you to consider what it is that you might contribute. The brain puzzle is missing pieces, and perhaps some of these would fit you perfectly. One thing, we are facing a huge crisis financially, and within this crisis situation, there is a tendency to cut the costs at all costs. One of the areas which is facing imminent cuts is research, science, and education, higher education principle. We cannot do that. I've just signed the petition earlier today, which is urging our government to consider not doing that. It would be tantamount to actually shutting down the brain of someone who is stuck in a labyrinth and expecting them to find a way out. In the long term, cutting down investments into science, research, development, and education is not a winning strategy. Um, so maybe you can join me in voicing your concern. But apart from that, you may also contribute in different ways. Um, I don't know, it depends on what stage of your personal development you might find yourself. It could be that what suffices is just that you read about brain and brain research and find out about those ama amazing um, advances that we've made. Um, it may be that you can help us then educate others, talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, help them live healthier for as long as they do. Um, maybe you are young enough to consider becoming a neuroscientist. That would be awesome. We need you. Perhaps you are a skilled professional with expertise that's missing in our interdisciplinary teams that are tackling these problems. You know, thinking out of the box and having a different perspective, that's important. We need you. Perhaps you are um, you're someone with means. And perhaps you could invest some of that into research and science. Um, it's, it might sound trivial, but even um, the small contributions that Slovenian Neuroscience Association gets from lay public who are interested in the developments in the brain research field 
have enabled us to provide scholarships for students who are going abroad to learn or to present their work. Um, it's a small step, but it's a significant one. And above all, and I'm finishing here, my time's up, um, take time to reflect on the magnificent thing that you possess. Um, there's no innovation, there's no creativity, and there's no change without the brain. So, mind it. Thank you.